Good day, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us. I'm Jonathan Edelheit, the CEO of the Medical Tourism Association. Um, good to have you on our call today, our webcast on penetrating new markets and meeting the buyers of uh, healthcare at the 7th World Medical Tourism Congress. Um, so we're going to really be covering today a little bit about um, the World Medical Tourism and Global Healthcare Congress, which is taking place at September 20th through the 24th in Washington, D.C. And talking about uh, the, the type of buyers that are at our event, um, and, and then also going to a little about how you approach um, those specific buyers and, and what is the approach for those buyers, but mainly going in uh, over the type of buyers and what happens at our event and the experience and everything. Um, so I know there's some people, uh, you know, that were on our last webcast, um, um, so some of the information that um, a little of the information we discussed on the web, last webcast about um, specifically U.S. buyers will uh, be covered here. Um, so, uh, you know, our conference this year, um, you know, is, uh, as I said, it's September 20th to the 24th in Washington, D.C., so we definitely expect a lot more government participation from different governments around the world, especially since there are a lot of embassies um, in the D.C. area. So one of the um, uh, neat things that we have uh, that we've added this year is for sponsors, it's something that we just rolled out uh, about uh, two weeks ago, is um, guaranteed um, uh, networking meetings at the Congress where you can get up to 14 guaranteed one-on-one -on -one networking meetings with our buyers, depending on the level of sponsorship that you have. And then we also have, um, uh, for members, uh, we just rolled out a new benefit within the Medical Tourism Association where you're going to get guaranteed patient leads um, up to 500. Uh, per year, depending on your level of membership, and up to 200 guaranteed buyer leads, um, depending on your level of membership. So this is something we just um, recently changed, and we did that because of, uh, you know, we got a lot of feedback from uh, members and from industry professionals that this is what you guys really wanted. So what we've done is, on top of all the other benefits that you get as membership, um, these are new uh, membership benefits, and as top of uh, what you get for sponsorship, these are new sponsorship benefits. Um, so, uh, you know, the Medical Tourism Conference, uh, the MTA event, is a conference like no other. Um, it is the only plug-and-play agenda in the industry, so we really have over 100 speakers and, um, and uh, several different tracks in medical tourism. Um, from case studies of what hospitals that are doing successfully um, in different parts of the world in all five regions to, um, uh, to marketing and business development uh, um, tracks to teach you how to take your medical tourism business to the next level um, to insurance and buyer tracks. Um, so, you know, we had last year about 2,200 attendees and um, they're from about 90 different countries. So it's really the only global event in medical tourism, you know, for those of you that haven't bring, uh, been, and it brings in buyers of healthcare from all five different uh, continents. Um, and uh, there's a lot of career advancement where we have on-site certification workshops where you can come to the conference and actually become a certified medical tourism professional or um, a new program which we recently rolled out where you can actually become at the conference a medical tourism marketing professional. But you can do those um, online or you can do them um, at your, uh, at your um, uh, uh, online at your own pace or at the actual event. Um, so uh, a couple things uh, to also go in there, CME credits. Um, and, uh, you know, if you're a doctor or you're working in a hospital that has doctors that are involved in medical tourism, um, then you can come and uh, get continuing medical education credit. Um, there's uh, innovative networking software. This is um, it, it's either a tool that you either can, uh, you know, attendees actually really maximize and use or attendees don't use at all. And for those who don't use it at all, it's a mistake. Um, and uh, with that networking software, we've had people who've scheduled, literally they've requested like 200 networking meetings and scheduled anywhere from 50 to 75. Um, so you can go on to the networking software and look who's actually attending and um, request one-on-one -on -one meetings and then have those one-on-one -on -one meetings at our event. Um, and then our conference 
I'll be going into this a little bit later, but it's integrated with the um, Global Benefits Conference and the Employer Healthcare and Benefits Congress. So um, the Global Benefits Conference is the only conference um, in, the, in the world for multinational employers and insurance companies, and it's the official event of the Global Benefits Association. And then the Employer Healthcare and Benefits Congress is the largest U.S. insurance and benefits conference um, that brings in all the self-funded and fully insured employers, all the insurance agents, and the carriers. Um, so really, um, there's a lot of potential buyers at our conference um, in the area of, uh, of medical tourism. And then we're also, this year, we're doing some new stuff with a live, uh, live patient webcast, where um, we're going to be doing live webcasts from the event out to medical tour, uh, potential uh, prospective medical tourism patients to learn about where they can go for care. Um, and, uh, and so the, I, this slide kind of covers a little bit of what I um, already covered, but it also shows the attendee profile um, from last year and the breakout of employer and benefits managers and insurance companies and governmental organizations and healthcare providers. So the type of people who attend the event, um, international uh, hospitals, insurance companies, um, uh, employee benefits consultants, agents, insurance brokers, doctors, um, tourism boards, ministries of health, health attaches, other governmental entities, um, employers, air ambulance, travel assistants, travel insurance companies, uh, medical tourism facilitators, HR professionals, travel agents, healthcare investors, and technology companies. Um, so it's really the one place in the world where you can come once per year and meet all the major players in the, um, in the industry and get all your business done at once. Um, so one of the things um, that we also do is we have a Buyers of Healthcare program. And this program, I, I think it's really important because it's really um, the only qualified buyers program in, in the world. So um, we, you know, th uh, you know, we reach a lot of um, individuals through our database, through our magazine, um, through workshops and training that we do all over the world, um, through social media. Um, you know, we have a very, very large uh, presence. You know, just in the, in the U.S., for example, we reach a half a million HR and insurance executives um, through our email uh, database. And, um, and then overseas, it's several hundred thousand. And then we reach about 300,000 B2B professionals just on LinkedIn and about 40 different groups that we manage. Um, so we know who all the buyers are around the world, and we really um, qualify them so that when you know that you're coming to the conference, you're meeting qualified buyers um, that are serious in the area of medical tourism. Um, and you don't, you know, you, uh, you know, I think the, the challenge of that is, um, is that there are a lot, you know, there are more, I would say, tiny or smaller events going on in medical tourism um, in different parts that really aren't conferences where you might get 20 to 50 people. Um, and some of them will say we're bringing in buyers. Um, when they're not really buyers. They're consultants who are trying to sell services to hospitals. They're what we were considered sellers. Um, and some of them, um, you know, maybe never have sent patients before, or some of them, um, you know, are, are people of extreme un unethical practices. Um, you know, we've seen conferences bring in uh, people who are buyers who, um, you know, they're stealing money from patients, and they're bringing them in to introduce them to hospitals. Um, so I, and I, you know, one of you, uh, I'm assuming many of you might have seen, uh, you know, some of the one or two of the articles um, from, I think it was this week, maybe it was last Thursday or Friday, um, about a facilitator who was just forced into bankruptcy um, by patients because they paid them for services and the facilitator did not deliver those services. Um, so very serious. And, you know, with that, that's why I'm just re reinforcing is, that you know, we vet all of our buyers. We look at what region of the world they're from, how many patients that they've sent, um, you know, how long they've been in business, um, and then they come specifically to network, and they're required to network um, with our exhibitors and sponsors and other hospitals. Um, and we bring in buyers from you know from well, like last year we brought in 15 buyers specifically for Russia and CIS countries, Asia, Africa, literally all over the world. Um, 
so I, I can't stress that enough. The Qualified Buyers Program is really a great program. If any of you who are on this webcast are actually buyers, you know, please reach out to us um, to find out how you can attend the event. And also, you can go online and fill out our buyer, uh, you know, our application to become a hosted buyer. So this is a little bit of a breakout of pre-approved international buyers outside of the U.S. because we have we bring in all the buyers from the U.S. So that's not even um, that's not even an issue. And if you've been to our show, you've seen that all the big employers and insurance companies. But then we have um, you know 19% from the Middle East, 4% uh, from South America, 19% from Africa, 35% from Europe. Um, Caribbean, you know, 4%, uh, Asia, 15%, Canada, 3%. So we're really bringing in them from all over the world. And, you know, looking at governmental entities, we bring in health ministries and, um, you know, ministers of health and health attaches, some that are responsible for billions of dollars um, in sending patients overseas. And, and those people who are responsible for it are there. So if you're coming, you can connect with them, you know, if you, if you really do your work and diligence. Or if you're a sponsor with your guaranteed networking meetings, you can request for us to schedule meetings with them. So we organize at our event the only global um, ministerial summit in the world. This will be the fifth year where we're bringing in um, ministers of health, economy, um, tourism, to, and um, to this tra uh, ambassadors, consuls, generals to discuss the issues of medical tourism and population health management, um, how to build sustainable programs, um, you know, invest in the healthcare infrastructure, um, how to attract international patients, or if you're trying to um, build your own healthcare infrastructure, how to invest in your quality and, and other, other factors. Um, so, um, you know, here are um, just a couple testimonials. Um, you know, I'm not sure if you can actually read them on the webcast, so I'll just throw them out. Because I think it's, it's in, and we have testimonials on our website, but I think it's important to hear from others versus hearing it from um, us. Um, so, uh, Ada from Poland said, you know, it's important for Poland to participate in the MTAs conference because our program is uh, relatively new and it's important for us to be able to exchange ideas, make contacts, which is helpful for us. Uh, we made a lot of contacts and gained a lot of knowledge about promotion and marketing. Um, this year we brought five companies from Poland and we plan to bring even more companies in 2014. Um, David Miller from New Terror Global Healthcare, really great company um, that's heavily active in medical tourism, growing really fast, uh, one of the bigger players in the industry, and they're actually buying hospitals um, and turning them into international hospitals for medical tourism, and they're taking over hospitals and specifically, um, when I say taking over, managing, building out international patient programs for hospitals in the U.S. and overseas. Um, and they were the sponsor of our ministerial summit last year, um, and I really loved his uh, testimonial because it says, we accomplished in one day the kind of networking that would otherwise have taken us 12 to 24 months, if not longer. We were able to present directly to almost 100 ministers of health, and in a lot of cases, these are people we would have never gotten in front of. MTA has access to independent medical tourism facilitators, and they've declared that those contacts, those are contacts they'll pass along to us as well. This is really the most valuable conduit of information and opportunity that we could ask for. So I think, I think David's testimonial is one of the key fundamentals that I think is important about going to events. Um, if you go to the right conference, you can accomplish what would take you two years to do in just two to three days. And I think on the medical tourism side, it's even more important because this is international business. Um, and with international business, you need to develop business relationships that are personalized and one-on-one. -on -one. You, this is medical tourism is not an industry that you can just send an email or pick up, you know, pick up the phone and, and have one call and, and with that email or LinkedIn message say, hey, we're a great hospital, um, we'll give you commission, we have great doctors, send us patients. It's not going to happen. You have to build a business relationship and a personal relationship with the buyers where they feel comfortable in sending you patients last year. Um, I was just told one of the employers um, uh, that was at our conference last year, a U.S. employer who's self-funded. Um, they're, you know, they've implemented medical tourism, and they're sending their first patient overseas. I think it's this month or next month, um, and uh, there'll be a speaker this year again at our conference, which is great. Um, but that patient that they're sending is going to a French hospital that they specifically met at our conference. Um, you know, the same example with Nutera. Nutera is going to be doing business 
um, is, is going to be doing a lot of business with people they met at our conference. Um, uh, you know, uh, two, two, I always use this example in, in some of the presentations. So I think it was two years ago, maybe three, there was a facilitator who met a hospital from Latin America at our conference. Um, from that meeting, um, you know, they, they built a really great relationship. That year, that facilitator sent 500 patients to that hospital for a cutting-edge new procedure that cost about $10,000 a patient. So it's about a $5 million um, uh, piece of business from this one facilitator. Um, what happened at that hospital? They were an exhibitor two to three years ago. Um, what happened uh, towards the end of the year um, with that large amount of patients they were getting? Um, you know, I'm friends with the, the, the people who run the International Patient Department. I've known them for years. And they told me, Jonathan, we, we have a real problem. Our medical director of our hospital has told us that our program is extremely successful, extremely profitable, and that the hospital now has a global brand and people know it. And we do not, we no longer need to invest in uh, medical tourism. We're not going to invest in marketing brochures. We're not going to invest in our website. And we're no longer, we no longer have a budget to go to conferences because we've gotten so much business from medical tourism. What happened fast forward um, to that hospital? That business tapered off. And they also um, uh, weren't getting all the new business that they expected. And they weren't getting that business because all their competitor hospitals were coming to our conference, and all the new facilitators that were coming in the industry were building a relationship with them because they didn't know this other hospital existed. And then they also started losing some of their other existing clients of people who sent them patients because those clients that they were working with who were referring them patients were, for example, coming to our conference and building new relationships with new hospitals. So it's a common concept, and it doesn't matter what business that you're in. You need to be in the face of your clients or your prospects all the time. And if you're not there, they will forget about you. Um, I see that in day in, day out business. And you have to realize that you know people have personal lives. They're getting personal emails, personal texts. They have business lives. You know, and, and you're just one piece of their, of, their, of their lives, one small piece of their lives. So if you're not always there building um, – uh, building relationships with them, you're not going to get that business. And the business you did get, you're going to lose. So you need to really build a sustainable strategy. And I, you know, I apologize if I'm going on with that for so many slides, but it's so important. Um, you know, I'm very active in the U.S. and the global insurance marketplace, and I go and I speak at events um, and things like that. And there are, there are events that I know you have to be at this event because if you're not at this event, people, um, you know, you're, you're going to lose uh, all the business opportunities that are going to come for when you bump into existing partners or potential new partners and you're able to get into those one-on-one -on -one business meetings to talk about um, projects that you, uh, that you want to do together during the year. Um, and then one other piece of information that I will share that I think is really important. Um, there are new organizations coming into this industry all the time. So there's new hospitals coming into medical tourism, new doctors, new facilitators, and new buyers of healthcare. There, there are probably, I would say, thousands of new buyers of healthcare coming into medical tourism every year. If you're talking about facilitators, insurance companies, employers, um, each one being a buyer, there's new ones that have decided, hey, this is the year we want to learn about medical tourism. This is the year we want to implement it. Um, and for those people, here's a reality check. No matter, you know, if you're a hospital, if you're a facilitator, you know, or anyone, they have no idea who you are. Um, and 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 a lot, there are some hospitals that will have a little bit of the attitude of, I am the best hospital in my country, and therefore I don't need to promote myself because when a buyer decides they want to send a patient to my country, whether it's Korea, whether it's Costa Rica, whether it's Germany, whether it's Dubai, they're going to find out that I'm the best hospital and they're going to send me patients. And that is not true. You might have a brand locally, but you do not have a brand internationally. And we see time and again um, hospitals that are second or third tier hospitals um, and not known as the best locally are getting business because they're being more aggressive and building relationships um, with buyers. And then also, 
Along with that, I'll tell buyers of healthcare, insurance agents, facilitators, insurance companies, work with who you can build a great relationship with. So if that top, if, if there's a top center of, uh, if there's a top hospital in Thailand, and they're not coming to meet you at a conference, or they're not willing to build a relationship because they think they're they're too good and you should come to them, then go build a relationship with a with a with a hospital or a facilitator. Um, that that you know is going to care about you, that you're going to be in good hands with, and they're going to they're going to provide you that high level of service and want to really nurture and build that relationship. Um, so going back to who are qualified buyers, so I mentioned before, U.S. and multinational insurance companies, um, we bring a lot of them in, um, and you know agents, brokers, CPAs. These are some logos. Hopefully you can see them of, of you know people who've attended our event before from you know Aetna, Alliance, AXA, Bupa, Chartis, Cigna. Um, United Healthcare, MetLife, HTH, uh, Geo Blue, all the, all, they're all there. All the insurers are there. Um, so you can travel the world and try to meet these people, or you can come um, to one place at one time. And, and a big area that I think um, that a lot of hospitals are, are missing and facilitators is the multinational um, marketplace. And when I say the multinational marketplace, is not, you know, you know, looking at the fact of, we bring in a lot of big companies that have global offices and employees all over the world. And, you know, whether it's Walmart, HP, IBM, um, Apple, Facebook, is going after them, specifically the, the multinational employers and insurers, for patients that are, that could be, that are, I'm sorry, expats living in the country who can come to your hospital. Um, so not just patients from other countries, but the actual expat living in that country or regionally who you can bring into your facility. Um, and going back to that, that's a huge lost opportunity. And there's no one really going after that marketplace. And a lot of hospitals make the mistake um, of not going after those insurance companies or saying, you know what, we, are, we have a contract um, with Aetna. We have a contract with Blue Cross Blue Shield. We have a contract with SOS. Um, so we don't need to go after a contract. And, you know, they don't even realize, no, 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 you, you have a, one of 10,000 hospitals that have a contract with them. They don't even know who you are. They don't, you're not even on their radar. And you don't have the right contract with them. And you're not even talking to the right people. So they might say, well, I know, I know Joe Smith or I know Michael, Michael Lee in China, in Beijing, who works for this company. But that's not the right person who's in a different division um, you need to deal with the person dealing with expats. You need the people dealing with emergency evacuation. Um, I'm working on a project in Asia right now where, you know, a hospital, so as I was saying before I cut off, um, you know, just contacted by a hospital system in Asia where for three to six months they have been trying to go to every international insurance company and get um, contracts so that local expats and regional expats could come to their hospital. And they said for three to six months, they could not get anyone to return their phone call, no one to respond to their emails, um, and they couldn't get any contracts. So they came to us and said, hey, can you help with this? And the answer to that was, yes, we can, because you know we and I personally work with all the international insurance companies. So a lot of it is, is, is knowing how to approach the insurance companies and the buyers and who you know. Um, so, you know, you know, it's the kind of, uh, you know, this is, um, you know, the, some of the logos of the buyers we had before, um, but they're there. Um, you know, we signed last year a multi-year um, partnership with Bupa, which is the largest international insurance company in the world with about 14 million covered lives. It's building a whole center of excellence model, um, you know, getting um, their global insured, 14 million people, to travel to hospitals that have the best quality outcomes. Um, and we put on a really successful uh, summit in partnership with Bupa last year um, that was all focused on uh, that centers of excellence. And we have hospitals from all around the world that are part of Bupa's network, um, you know, come and listen to this, how to become a center of excellence. Um, so it's neat to see um, what Bupa is doing and how we're working with Bupa to really make this change globally and getting hospitals to move to higher quality and centers of excellence and transform internally. And I think you're going to see a lot of international insurance companies that um, follow this. Um, so one of the things that I'll say is when you come 
to our events, it's important to, under, to develop a successful strategy and look at who you're going after. Is it insurance companies? Is it self-funded employers? Is it TPAs? Is it agents, brokers, and consultants? And with that, how you approach them. Um, you know, you, you want to approach them in a sophisticated way. You want to speak their language. You want to get the most out of the meeting. Um, so, to, so to give you some examples, um, insurance agents and brokers advise employers on what benefits to implement. They can get commissions. Um, and if you get them um, uh, actively involved in believing in, um, in what you're doing in medical tourism, they can go, they might have five employer clients, they might have 500 employer clients, and they can go enroll medical tourism out um, to all their clients, and they go out and do open enrollment meetings and educate the individual employees on using the benefit. Where consultants, employee benefit consultants, don't get commission, they get a fixed fee from the client. So you don't want to approach an employee benefits consultant and offer them commission because they can't accept commission on implementing medical tourism. Um, for TPAs, third-party administrators who administer self-funded plans for employers, um, some of them will take commissions. Um, some of them uh, won't, but they're a little conservative. So you have to approach them and get them very um, uh, you know, passionate about medical tourism and explain why they should be offering it to their clients. Um, if you're dealing with employers directly to implement medical tourism plan, you do not offer them commissions. Um, you know, they cannot accept commissions, and they, I think they will be offended if you offered them commissions. And they're more concerned about high-quality health care and also um, lowering, uh, lowering liability and making sure their employees are going to the best doctor and having a great outcome. Employers and insurance companies are not going to be concerned with the most affordable or cheapest price. Um, they will pay more for a procedure if they know they're going to get higher quality care, better outcomes, and that their insured or their employees are more comfortable traveling to that destination. So that is a very key point meaning that um, if I'm an employer or an insurance company, I want people to travel for medical tourism. So if they travel for medical tourism, then I'm saving money. So I'd rather choose a destination that I know is high quality here and it's a little bit more expensive than other destinations, but knowing I'll have more volume of employees who are insured who are traveling. So it's important to understand that, how quality in the doctor's experience is extremely important. One of the things that we, um, we organize that um, I think, you know, it, it's a summit at our event that many of you probably aren't aware of, um, you know, but something comes up that says, hey, do the multinational insurance companies, um, the global insurance companies, do they come to your event because that's who I want to meet? And we've already covered that they come to our event. But one specific uh, summit we organize within our event is the Global Medical Network Director Summit. And this is different than our, um, our medical director summit, which is um, chief medical officers and medical directors at hospitals. The Global Medical Network Director Summit is specifically where we're bringing in the people responsible for the international insurance companies who are in charge of their provider networks, their hospital networks, and they're the ones that contract with the hospitals and steer their members towards those hospitals throughout the world. So the people that all the hospitals want to come and meet and contract with to get the business, they're there and they're a part of the global medical director summit. Um, for those of you that aren't aware of TPAs, so there's a large portion, I don't know if we have it in this slide and I apologize if we don't, but a majority of employers, if we're looking just at U.S. buyers, um, um, because we already covered the global buyers, so to recap the global buyers, um, ministers of health, health attaches from all over the world, facilitators and buyers from all over the world, Russia, CIS countries, Asia, Middle East, GCC, Africa, Latin America, we're bringing them in. We have, we have the program. But TPAs are, are global, but specifically here in the U.S., a majority of U.S. employers that have over 200 employees self-fund their health plan. And what that means is they don't work with Blue, Shield, Blue Cross Blue Shield, Aetna, SIGS, and United Healthcare. They pay their own medical costs and claims for their employees. So we don't have universal health care or public health care in the U.S. Um, you know, so individuals either pay for it or their employers do. But a majority of employers, 200 or more, and the majority of health plans in the U.S. are self-funded. And when they self-fund their health care plan, um, they really want to save money. Um, and so 
this is where we'll, we'll see, and I'll go into a case study in a little while, but they'll hire a TPA, a third-party administrator, who acts like an insurance company. They pay the medical claims. They put together the medical network. They do customer service for the employees. Um, they, they do everything. Um, so it's really important to understand that you also want to target um, TPAs. And we actually recently um, uh, just published our annual um, U.S. Uh, third-party administrator um, um, uh, report, and it um, basically lists all the uh, third-party administrators in the country. Um, and that's something that we're going to offer. It's going to be included for um, MTA members that are elite members, um, and it also certain levels of sponsorship. They'll be able to get it annually. Um, I think it's got about 14, 1,500 um, TPAs across the country that administer self-funded plans, um, or um, you know uh, anyone will be able to purchase it for I think about two thousand dollars, and it will be on a website in the next uh, couple weeks. So um, you know if you're coming to meet U.S. buyers, um, one of the things that's out there is uh, you know what, what about U.S. healthcare reform? Um, there's a lot of misinformation. It's very difficult to get information. Is um, it, it, does U.S. healthcare reform mean medical tourism? Um, no one's going to travel outside the U.S. for medical tourism, and. The answer to that is no, it doesn't. Um, med med uh, healthcare reform, uh, the Affordable Care Act, has increased the cost of healthcare. They have not gone down; they've gone up. It's provide it's made insurance guarantee issue where everyone um, has to be accepted, and they no longer can exclude you or charge you more if you have a pre-existing condition or you're sick. So, and then some of the other benefits are there used to be it was allowed to have annual or lifetime limits on individuals. Um, now it's unlimited because someone can run up $5 million in claims in one year, $10 million in their lifetime where, where it didn't work that way before. If you take those four things, guarantee issue, um, uh, have to take anyone regardless of their health condition, and they pay the same rate as a healthy person along with no lifetime or annual maximums, it's pretty common sense costs are going up. It means you're giving people really um, un, uh, you know, unlimited coverage. So um, as costs are going up, this is the opening the door to more employers implementing medical tourism internationally. Also, there's a big growth um, of domestic medical tourism, which is um, uh, patients um, traveling within the U.S. to top centers of excellence. So like um, uh, Lowe's partnered with the Cleveland Clinic for Heart Procedures, Johns Hopkins with Pepsi, Boeing's done it, Walmart's done it. Um, so there's a big area of growth on domestic medical tourism, and that's covered at the conference um, this year. But also I think that's a really great growing sign if you're looking um, to tap into the U.S. buyers, is there's, it's showing that the trend has already taken off for um, employers knowing let's waive deductible coinsurance and pay travel, um, cover travel expenses for the patient and a loved one to travel to the best hospital within the U.S. Um, so the next big stage that we'll be seeing is globally. And, um, you know, the U.S. is a multicultural, um, uh, you know, uh, people now. Um, you know, uh, this year, 50 per, more than 50% of the babies born will be multicultural and ethnic and not white Caucasian babies. So this is where the country is headed, and a lot of, there's not a lot of focus on the ethnic employee. Um, or the ethnic individual going after Hispanic Americans, bringing them back to your country, going after Muslim Americans and, and inviting them to come, you know, to the GCC or Middle East for, uh, for medical care. Ah, here are my stats on self-funding. So I wish I would have saved that part of the presentation until then. So large employers in the U.S. with 200 or more employees, 83% offer some kind of self-funded plan. That's huge. So one thing that I forgot to mention is that with a self-funded plan, an employer could decide instantly, I want to implement medical tourism. All they need to do is add a paragraph, a clause to their insurance uh, program, and it's, and it's implemented. So there's very little compliance, very little bureaucracy, and it's very easy for them to make a decision. And this is why self-funded employers are attractive um, to go after for medical tourism, where if it's fully insured, like a Blue Cross, an Aetna, Cigna, um, some of them have actually implemented medical tourism. They're actually doing it. It's, it's totally incorporated within their plans. They just, no one talks about it publicly. Um, so if you hear of someone saying insurance companies in the U.S. aren't doing medical tourism, you know totally false. Um, because Cigna, for example, it's, it's a part of their program. 
Um, and they're one of the largest health insurers in the U.S. 51% um, of covered U.S. workers are in self-funded plans as of 2013. So the majority of U.S. workers are self-funded. And then what happens is you'll see at the bottom there, and we really uh, apologize for not having an example in this webcast, but for stop-loss insurance, um, every self, most self-funded employers get stop-loss insurance. So they, they, they take the risk of their health plan on their own, but they cap it and they say, okay, you know, and it depends on the size of the employer, but they can say at $50,000 or at $100,000, um, I'm going to buy stop loss that another that an insurance company will pay in and pay medical claims for any individual employee over $100,000. So the reason why medical tourism is so attractive to these self-funded employers, it means they're paying out of pocket the company up to that $100,000. So if they get someone going who has a knee replacement that's 50 or 80,000 in the U.S. and they get them to go overseas and it's like $15,000, they just save like $35,000 out of pocket if it's a heart procedure. You know, um, that's not an emergency that could be planned out, and it's a $150,000 procedure here, and they get someone to go overseas for $20,000, um, you know, that's $130,000 savings. So the savings goes directly into the employer's pocket. So the next, um, the next part will be um, is um, what about, um, what about uh, self-funded employers, and are self-funded employers um, doing medical tourism. And we recently, there, there was, um, you know, just so you know, is my background is self-funding. Um, I've been doing self-funding for, for, for like 15 years, and I used to run a national TPA, and I um, was the first person in the U.S. to implement medical tourism in a self-funded plan back in 2004. Um, and with that, um, you know, we had, we had a lot of success with self-funding. So, you know, employers are doing self-funding. And no one's talking about it, though. No one goes public and says, hey, we're doing self-funding. We're right here. You know, come write, us, write about us in the media. But I did, um, we worked with a member of our association called HSM, which is a manufacturing company in North Carolina, and a hospital member of ours. Um, in uh, in Costa Rica, and we worked with Nightline and Diane Sawyer, which is one of the top um, you know news shows in the U.S. ABC News, and we, we put together a story, the MTA from start to finish, with um, and, and HSM, our member, uh, for the first time said, you know what, we're we're willing to go on record, we're willing to tell the world and the U.S. our story on medical tourism, and they have for the past five years. Um, they have uh, sent 250 employees overseas and saved $10 million. Um, so this is a great story, and, and this is the first employer to go on record about doing medical tourism. And I think the great part about this is it's not a, well, they tested it out and one or two employees went. It, it's, a, it's, it's almost like a clinical trial in, in medicine. Five years, 250 employees, $10 million. Um, so there's no question, high quality, great outcomes. The employees, um, uh, you know, travel. They love the program. They waive deductible co-insurance. They pay travel expenses. So that's on our website if you want to watch it. Um, and you can watch the video following two employees going to, for, uh, for care. You can follow what, um, you know, how the employer views the program and what the employees view of the program. And this is going to, this is going to really open a floodgate of self-funded employers implementing medical tourism because they have a case study. They have something they can watch that shows it works and alleviates all the concerns they have about the program. Um, and, you know, and so if you ever hear of anyone out there saying, you know what, Self-funded employers aren't going to do medical tourism. Um, they just don't know what they're talking about. Um, and they're, they really don't understand U.S. health insurance. They don't understand health care reform. They don't understand um, self-funding. Because health care reform encourages employers to self-fund because when you're fully insured, you have to have mandated essential benefits and you have premium taxes and insurance company profits. So there's a bigger trend of employers going self-funding. And when they're going self-funding, they're, they're, they're doing medical tours, and they're doing domestic, and they're doing international. And I work with all the big employer groups out there. I work with a lot of self-funded employers, a lot of agents, a lot of TPAs. 
um, and really this is uh, this is the trend. So I encourage you all to go on the MT's website, or it's also I think on the Medical Tourism Congress website. Um, we have a lot of forums and roundtables at our conference, um, and uh, and you know you can participate in these, and I encourage you to participate in these. Um, so we have like the facilitator forum, we have hospital forums for partnerships. We had a group of like 30, 40 facilitators sitting around a table um, discussing collaboration and issues facing the industry and how, to, how they have to move past it. Um, we have an employer direct contracting summit this year. This is all about employers learning how to contract directly with hospitals for whether it's domestic or international medical tourism. There's a big trend in the U.S. of employers uh, going around insurance companies or TPAs, and now doing direct contracts with hospitals. So Lowe's, Cleveland Clinic, Johns Hopkins, Pepsi, HSM, and the hospital in Costa Rica, um, you know, the self-funded employer sending patients overseas. So a lot of their uh, direct contracting. Um, as I said, the Medical Tourism uh, Facilitator Forum, um, there's an there's a EU forum um, for EU hospitals and governments. There's a lot of different forums. Um, you know, so you, you really want to look on our website under like executive summits and forums and look at one you want to go to and kind of RSVP. Um, I'll run into a couple sponsor testimonials. Um, as I just said before, I, I really like uh, when it's other people's words and, and not ours. Um, so uh, Anas Wajid, um, Director of Sales and Marketing for Fortis Healthcare in India, one of the top hospitals in the world and in India, said, we have met many facilitators who send patients overseas and we have met with self-funded employers who are looking for savings, and India can really come in big time there. The MTA creates a platform which allows the various stakeholders in the industry to come together and exchange views, look at opportunities that are there, and see how they can work together. Most of the time, there is too much um, uh, it's just completion, uh, maybe it's competition, but I think it's the, the word is competition, I'm sorry. But this is an opportunity for three days to step back and look at what can be done jointly and the MTA's role is extremely important in creating that platform. Um, uh, William Pagero from University of California, San Diego Health, which is the sponsor of our ministerial summit, um, said there are two words I can use for my experience at this year's conference, and that's fantastic and fantastic. This is the seventh time that I've been involved with this, uh, the group prior to the Los Angeles conference. This has been wonderful. The mix is even better. The topics are, are um, are great. The selection of booths have really improved. The networking opportunities are just fantastic. And there was a, cro a cross of a section uh, selection of American companies, European companies, global companies. I met a lot of people that were created bonds with. Here's the list of our executive summits and forums. Some, the Global Ministerial Summit, the Caribbean Ministerial Summit. We have a medical director summit where medical directors from hospitals around the world come. The Medical Tourism Research Summit, the fourth Wellness Tourism Conference. EU Summit, we have a Women's Healthcare and Leadership Summit, um, an HR Summit, um, um, I already mentioned the Employer Direct Contracting Summit, um, the Facilitator Forum, Destination Branding Forum, um, Chambers, a Chamber of Commerce Forum, um, Health and Hospitality, uh, a Latin American um, Development Forum for Latin American Hospitals, Destination Health, which is emerging hospitals meeting um, uh, uh, developed hospitals, um, we ha also have an EU directive on cross-border health care um, and an MTA destination marketing uh, ranking and marketing um, session. So what, would it, what is the cost for your company to arrange face-to-face -face meetings with potential business partners from all, all over the world? Um, and oh, I'm sorry, my uh, screen just accidentally minimized, please. So uh, what would it cost for um, people to come from around the world? So in international round-trip airfare can cost anywhere from um, $1,000 to $2,000. And um, uh, you know, if you get two nights hotel, but you're really probably coming for three nights, um, and you're going to be also away from work, um, you know, really just coming for 20 meetings, and I think this is a low estimate because I travel all over the world all the time, you know, $40,000. Um, so there's 20 face-to-face -face meetings, and it can cost, and it can cost even more. And then you've got time out of the office um, and away from work. So if you're traveling to 20 different countries to meet buyers, you've got, a, you know, you're going to be traveling most of the year. So the ability to come at one place at one time over a two to three day period, I think, is extremely um, invaluable. So 
how, how can you help develop a successful strategy, whether it's U.S. buyers of healthcare or international buyers, um, global buyers? You know, part, partnering with whoever it is, it's not just about a pretty marketing brochure. It's not about a pretty website and SEO. So some people might say, oh, advertise on Google, advertise on Yahoo. Um, go ahead and do SEO. Um, go ahead and let's create a great brochure, a great website, and this is going to drive you all the patients. That's, that's not really where it's at. Employers and insurance companies and sophisticated buyers of health care want um, – you know, they want to know they're getting high-quality health care, the experience of your doctors, and that your doctors are rock stars, and it's going to be positive outcomes, low risk, um, low complications, and providing an experience which employees and insured clients will feel, the patients, the health care consumers, will feel comfortable in coming to. That's their core concern. Um, you know, I, I think there's a little bit too much focus on saying, let's do Google Ads, let's create a great website, let's create a brochure and not focus on developing the relationships. And they say, wait a minute, why aren't we getting the patients? We've opened our door. Please come in, patients. Where, where are you? And they're not around, and it's because you've got to build relationships to get patients. And then there's the whole other side of it. There's hospitals that they have websites that don't have good information. They're not translated in the patient's language. The email addresses are bad. Um, they don't have the information that makes the patient feel comfortable. Um, I, I saw a totally new one. Um, yesterday for the first time that I think the hospital was trying to be extremely creative um, and do something different, um, but it was, uh, you know, it, it was impossible to navigate the website. Um, it, it, it was something that no Internet user is familiar with, um, and it was impossible, and you were forced to only go through the flow that the hospital wanted you to go through, not the logical flow of patient. And it was almost impossible to even find contact information to reach out to the hospital. So you need to also look at when you're creating a brochure, when you're creating a website, it's not based upon what you feel or what you want. It's your target market you want to go after. And along with that, I think it's also important where it's um, what target do you want to go after? Um, your target could be Middle East buyers. It could be U.S. buyers. It could be African buyers. And then within that segment, is it insurance companies, employers, doctors, facilitators, and you need to focus and hone your strategy on specifically them. Um, not necessarily casting a wide net and saying you want to go after everyone. I definitely think no matter where you are in the world, um, you know, if you're in Latin America, you should be targeting multicultural individuals and employees, whether they're in the United States, whether they're in Spain, they're in other countries, and try to get people who will come to your country and your hospital who there is no, there is no cultural barrier. They speak Spanish, they, they know the culture, they're familiar with the hospitals and the quality, and you don't have any of those issues. Um, and when we look at some of the surveys, uh, you know, one survey done a couple years ago found, you know, there aren't a lot of global surveys on patients. So I, I usually refer to some of the U.S. surveys and extrapolate that that would most likely be what would happen with global. Um, but white Americans, it was something like 35% um, uh, uh, Caucasian Americans said they travel overseas for health care if the quality was just as good or better and, the, and there were savings. And then when they asked Hispanic Americans, it jumped to like 55%, and the same for Asian Americans, like 55%. And the, and the, the, the jump is... Um, the majority of those multicultural individuals are willing to travel because they know the language, they know the culture, and they most likely have family over there. Um, and that's an area that really isn't uh, targeted that much. I already mentioned our innovative networking software um, where you can go in and search for attendees, build out your profile, almost like social media, um, and really connect with people. The benefit you really should use, you get email notifications for new and canceled meetings, and it works with all, all the smartphones. I'm going to skip through a couple of these slides. So um, I'm going to jump into some slides specifically on exhibiting. So why exhibit as a World Medical Tourism Congress? Um, you know, there's obviously there's no other event like it. There's nothing even in comparison to it. Um, you know, there's really small events, 50 to 100 people out there. Um, 
and uh, and the challenge is if, if you even try to go exhibit, exhibit there's there's very few exhibitors and there's there's no qualified buyers um, in the hall. Um, so we focus on um, bringing in the qualified buyers, and then we have, as I mentioned earlier, our guaranteed um, networking meetings for sponsors this year, which is the new benefit we rolled out. Um, and I think it's really important when I go to conferences that are key conferences, I'll, I'll have our company exhibit because it, it becomes very difficult to connect with people on a global basis, and there's so many. And when you have a booth and a presence, you're getting all the foot traffic of people you can use that are coming by. So you have your networking software where you can actually, um, uh, you know, schedule meetings and book your schedule as busy as possible, and then you get the other people that you meet that are coming by your booth. So we're going to have up to 140 exhibitors and sponsors, um, and the type of sponsors are, you know, US, international hospitals, U.S. hospitals, facilitators, governments, tourism boards. Um, law firms, airlines, travel and hospitality, insurance companies, uh, self-funded, the self-funded marketplace, um, and others. And as I was mentioned earlier, um, the event is integrated with the Employer Healthcare and Benefits Congress, the Global Benefits Conference, um, and then the EHBC is made up of the National Healthcare Reform Conference, the Corporate Wellness Conference, Voluntary Benefits Conference, and Self-Funding Conference. They all make up the Employer Healthcare and Benefits Congress, and it's the biggest benefits conference in the country, um, and the largest influencer um, of uh, U.S. insurance and HR executives and global HR and insurance executives in the world. Um, and the Global Benefits Conference is is the official event of the Global Benefits Association, which is a nonprofit trade group um, made up of uh, all the multinational companies and multinational insurers. And the board, you know, they, they have a you know, president is David Bryan, and then you have a, uh, a board which is made up of some of the leaders in um, multinational benefits around the world. So these are just uh, popping up for those of you who are more visually stimulated. The logos of um, the four conferences that make up the Employer Healthcare um, uh, Congress. So if you're looking um, to connect with self funded employers, it's there. If you're looking to learn about healthcare reform, it's there. Um, it's, uh, the Healthcare Reform Conference is the only conference in the country um, that has participation by the administration. Um, so the three main people within the Health and Human Her Her um, Services, the HHS, which is in charge of healthcare reform, um, the Department of Labor, which regulates healthcare reform, and the IRS, which deals with compliance and fines of healthcare reform, those three key people all did keynotes last year at the Healthcare Reform Conference. So it really brings in the who's who of, um, in government. Um, and within HR, um, insurance, and the law in the area of healthcare reform. And it's the only healthcare reform conference in the United States. Um, so why should you partner with, um, uh, you know, with the MTA? I think um, now, you know, we have, uh, for those of you who aren't aware, we have medicaltourism.com, which is the top portal um, that patients uh, use to learn about medical tourism. And we get thousands of patient inquiries per year that come through there. Um, and obviously, you can get guaranteed patient um, and uh, patient leads um, as a member, which is a new benefit, and also buyer leads. So as a member, you can get buyer lead. Now, we're providing you buyers who are sending patients overseas. Um, and then a global distribution channel um, uh, and, and events. So we, uh, we do destination branding programs. We do destination guides, like a Frommers or Photos for Countries. We've done Jordan. We've done... Um, uh, Miami, we partnered with Las Vegas and done it with Las Vegas. Um, we're, we were about to do one for Taiwan. Um, so we put these guides on our website for free and on iTunes and Amazon. It's a real way to educate patients and make them comfortable in traveling overseas. We have training and certification programs. We help with research and industry analysis. Um, and we also can help with program development and marketing and strategy. Um, you definitely need to create a multi-channel approach and not just focus on one channel, but going after multiple channels. Um, the different ways that you can um, work with us um, on a very highly sophisticated way, we're doing a lot of webcasts and white papers, like the one you're watching now, but we'll do them for buyers. Um, and you can sponsor those webcasts. Um, we did one for in the U.S. market for healthcare reform. Um, you know, with, we had almost a thousand people on the webcast, and we passed on the leads and the contacts of everybody that was on the webcast. Um, that, I think that's one of the most amazing ways for kind of qualified lead generation, but it's an educational webcast. Um, you know, we, we did one webcast with uh, Bupa uh, last year. You know, as I was mentioning earlier, one of the largest international insurers, and I think there was 
people from 90 different countries on that webcast. So the access you get from um, doing the webcast, and then we host it online for people to watch during the year. Um, and then we also could do some targeted social media strategy. And then you can, we're also doing workshops and trade missions all over the world that you can participate in. Um, and trade missions are going to another country and meeting with the Ministry of Health, doctors, hospitals, insurance companies to build referral sources. So we did those all over the world. We're going to be doing more. Um, we have a big Asia event um, that we're going to be doing in a couple months in Taipei. I think it's June 26th and 27th, so it'll be the, um, uh, our second Asia Medical Tourism Conference. Um, we have our Medical Tourism Magazine. I encourage anyone on the webcast, you know, feel free to contact us about how you can submit an article. We have about 120,000 subscribers in over 100 countries. It's the only magazine in medical tourism. And then we have our social network, um, Medical Tourism City, that I encourage you um, all to join where you can network. Now, I want to kind of go into our reach. I, I think it's important to understand our reach. So you could also think about how you can better work with us. Um, because there's a lot of things that we can do um, on, a, on a more customized approach for hospitals, governments, um, insurance agents, employers, um, um, in education, implementation, utilization, really um, fine-tuning things, and then on the business development side. So our social media, um, uh, the reach that the MTA has. Um, so as I was mentioning earlier, about a half a million email, you know, insurance and HR execs in the U.S., a couple hundred thousand overseas for healthcare uh, healthcare professionals, HR and insurance executives. Now, we focused heavily on social media over the last um, five, five, five years. And I'm going to actually be hosting a workshop on LinkedIn at our conference um, to really get people to understand how to maximize and use LinkedIn to help you in your business, your career, your life, everything. LinkedIn is an amazing tool. But we have, we have about 30,000 followers on a couple different groups we run on Facebook. Um, we also have, in about 40 different LinkedIn groups, over 300,000 members. So we're at with the biggest influencer in healthcare and insurance in, uh, on, on LinkedIn, um, which is the B2B side, which I think is extremely important and, and the big focus of most people in our industry. Um, so we, you know, we run um, some very big insurance groups. We run the Global, global Benefits and Insurance Group with thousands of leaders in global benefits for multinational companies. We run uh, the Healthcare Reform Group, which has, I think, about 27,000 HR and insurance executives in it. We run the Benefits Health and Welfare Professionals, which is an HR executive group for employers, about 20, 26,000 people in it. Our uh, Medical Tourism Group has about 6,000 people. We manage the um, Luxury Hotel and Travel Group, which I think is now up to 180,000 people. All these groups are doubling each, uh, each year in every 12 months. So while it's 300,000 this year, it's going to be 600,000 next year, 1.2 million in 2016. And we do a lot of education to these groups, to webcasts, white papers, continuing education. We invite them to our conference, but we can do specific campaigns for governments or hospitals to these groups in very sophisticated approaches. So feel free to reach out to us for that. We just did um, a, a LinkedIn survey. Um, the Employer Healthcare and Benefits Congress did in partnership with um, the Healthcare Reform Center and Policy Institute and the Corporate Wellness Association. And um, we're going to be doing our own study specifically in the medical tourism industry, but I wanted to share, share um, uh, the, these results. So insurance agents, brokers, and consultants who are advising U.S. employers. Um, you know, the question was asked, this is from last week, we had almost, I think, almost 1,000 people participate in our survey. Where do you feel you can receive the most timely and updated information on your industry? And almost 70% said social media. 73% um, said other internet. But television was 4.1% and trade magazines were 245 So other internet I look at is online news. You know, it could be CNN, Fox News, MSNBC, um, ABC News. But it's, it's showing that, you know, social media is where everybody's getting their information today. And that's where you have to be. Um, and, and, and we're going to be, uh, the LinkedIn workshop we'll be doing at the conference is going to focus on how do you, how do you um, create and really maximize your profile on LinkedIn for people to find you and for people to want to connect to you and people to want to listen to your message. And then we're going to be doing an advanced workshop, which is, you know, really focusing on, you know, advanced LinkedIn. You know, so, how, you know, let's say you're an HR executive. How do you use it? Um, to help get promotion or advance your career or get a new job? How do you use it as an HR executive to choose vendors and service providers? 
or if you're a vendor or service provider, how do you use LinkedIn to prospect and use it in a sophisticated way where you can get you know real ROI and not waste your time? Um, and you know, and we've really perfected that. So we're gonna we really want to share that with the industry. So I, I think that will have a really positive effect and help people really um, be a lot more successful and effective um, because you can get lost on social media. So that's going to kind of um, end our uh, end our webcast. I know we're a couple minutes um, we're a couple minutes over. Um, so we really, unfortunately, don't have time for any questions. If, if anyone has any questions, feel, feel free to call us um, at our uh, in the U.S. 561-791-2000, or um, you can also um, email us at info at Medical Tourism Association. If you're interested in um, in sponsorship, uh, Charlie Rodriguez handles our sponsorship in our organization, and his email is charlie at medicaltourismassociation.com. We're going to make this webcast. Um, available, um, it's going to be available probably within 24 to 48 hours if any of you want to watch it again. It will include the PowerPoint and the video. And then if any of you are interested in how, you know, we can work together more closely um, beyond membership, and it could even be um, partnership, um, you know, uh, and by the way, hello, Margaret, I see you're on the call. Um, I hope you're doing uh, uh, well. It's definitely been uh, a long time since we bumped into each other. Um, but there's different ways we can partner together and, and develop initiatives into different countries um, and, uh, and help your business grow, whether, and especially if you're a facilitator or working with hospitals overseas or doing something like that. So, you know, th this industry is global. It's difficult to be everywhere and do everything. And I think that, you know, it, it's all about partnerships and working together. Um, and, and that's what we're really open to is looking how we can create long-term partnerships um, and help in, in different areas. So if anyone has any questions, p please feel free um, to call or email and be happy to answer it. I really appreciate everyone uh, coming on the webcast and hope to see you soon um, somewhere in the world um, in our travel. So take care and uh, everyone have a, a really great week.